Andy Shalalam, the owner of Bus Boys and Pucks. Boys and Pucks. We are so happy to have Rock Newman, right, folks, Newman, this is Rock Newman. and the Rock Newman Show the join show, our show. tribe here. From the Langston show. Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Pucks. This is a place where racial... It, this Trayvon Martin Travis. ...and cultural connections are consciously uplifted. John uplifted. Florio, Chief of Police, Kathy Lynn, the Arm Williams. Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. A place where art... Miss art, Nikki art, Giovanni. Culture... culture yes, yes. ...and politics... Uh, politics Mayor Gray, politics, Reverend politics, Jesse Lewis Jackson. Marion S. Bear. Intentionally collide, oh, collide. Collide, collide, collide. This is, this is a space to take a deliberate pause and feed, finish feed, feed, what's feed, on your plate. Your mind, body, and soul. To ignite, soul, inspire, soul, soul, or instill. We believe by creating such a space, we can actually change our change, community. This beat was change, just change, absolutely fabulous. Change DC. DC. This is a part of my life. And change the world for the better. And this is better, Social Movement 2.0. And now, and now, The Rock Newman Show. The Rock Show. Newman the Rock Show. Newman Show. Rock Newman Show. Good morning, folks. This is The Rock Newman Show. Thank you for tuning in and for turning in. Uh, tell all of your friends and family and neighbors they want to watch this show. Um, we have had a lot of high-profile guests on The Rock Newman Show, and we're happy about that. Uh, tell your friends, call them. I'm going to give you a moment here to pick up the phone and call your friends and tell them to tune in because this show that we have today is a show that I think that might be more useful for you than any particular show that I've done in the past. I mean, this show is about you. Uh, I will uh, get to that in just a moment. Before I do, let me say that I am broadcasting live today, September the 28th, 2013, from Busboys and Poets at 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., Today is September the 28th. It's another beautiful day in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. We call that the DMV. That's for D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, for those of you watching around the world who might not know that. We have an action-packed lineup, a very impactful lineup today, a very pertinent, relevant, timely lineup. We start off today with Michael Nathan, who is the founder and CEO of the Good Thrift Benefits Corporation. Um, I'm going to sort of come back to Michael in just a moment, but we also have uh, in studio live with us today the District of Columbia, former D uh, District of Columbia 2009 Teacher of the Year, someone who continues to teach and continues to to impact the youth in Washington, D.C. in a very profound way. Uh, Kim Worthy is her name. Uh, she has been worthy in her great, doing a great job as an instructor here in the D.C. Um, uh, school system uh, to have had multiple invites to the White House. She is a, a, a high impact player in the world of education. You all may or may not know uh, about the <clears throat> about the news that came out, it was actually it had come out earlier, but there was some focus on it just this week about that Harvard University is waiving tuition for disadvantaged youth who qualify. And Kim Worthy, as Teacher of the Year in Washington D.C., is someone who gets her students qualified, who can help you get your students qualified. You know, it's not just a cliche, it's real, real that the youth are our future. You want to prepare them for the future and you wanna prepare them in a way that they will qualify. Tell your family, tell your neighbors, Harvard University is waiving the tuition for qualified students. Kim Worthy, D.C. Teacher of the Year. We're going to talk all about that. And then <clears throat> in our third hour, we have poet and political activist extraordinaire Stacey Ann Chen. Stacey, Stacey Ann Chen is a Jamaican-born poet who currently resides in Brooklyn, New York. Stacey Ann Chen has been on the Oprah show 60 Minutes. She's been featured at the Huffington Post and numerous other um, periodicals. She wrote a, uh, a fascinating book called The Other Side of Paradise. Can't wait for her to get here. And 
and do her thing. She's also performing tonight at Busboys and Poets at 5th and K Street, Northwest Washington at 8 p.m. Folks, I told you early on through my Facebook post, get your tickets early. It's sold out very quickly. But let us come back here today again, September the 28th, 2013, the Langston Hughes Room, Busboys and Poets, and let me give an official and really warm welcome to Michael Nathan. Thank you so much for joining the Rock Newman Show. Great to be here, Rock. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. And I have... Um, I've promoted your visit here today, and I have said to my followers in Twitter and in the Facebook and social media universe that we're going to talk about a number of things that impact individuals and families directly. Um, things such as credit, <laughs> things such as uh, oh, what, what is commonly being referred to now as Obamacare, which seems to be the centerpiece of a debate that threatens to shut down the United States government. Um, so again, I wanna thank you so much for coming here. Michael, let's start here. Good Thrift Benefits Corporation, what is that? Well, Rock, a, uh, a B Corporation is a new form of corporate structure. It's much like a regular C Corporation but B corporations are in business to solve social and environmental problems and bring solutions that have a material positive impact, either for society or the environment. And so what we do is we're sort policy right now. Folks talk so much about foreign policy and the billions that are spent there. And, you know, wise heads say, why not take care of home first? Can you please, given that this is such a hot button issue, walk us through what are the fundamentals of Obamacare? Well, uh, there's really two main parts to Obamacare. <clears throat> or the Affordable Care Act, or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and it's also called the ACA. Yeah, it lots, it, lots of names yeah, for it. And, which, and, they, and they have real names, but those who, in my estimation, have sought to demonize the president and to whip up, you know, frenzy and fury, fury have, you know, early on labeled it Obamacare, and somewhere later Obama embraced it. Well, maybe it should be called Obama Cares. Yeah. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> <laughs> but there are two main parts to the, to the law. There's an employer component, and then there's an indi individual component. So the employer component is referred to as the employer mandate. And many people are most familiar with the aspect of the employer mandate that says that if you have more than 50 employees, you're required to provide uh, insurance to them, and that's 50 full-time employees. Right. And if you have fewer you're not really subject to that employer mandate. And then the individual mandate, and we can talk more about this as we get into it, is a requirement come January 2014 for all individuals to have health insurance or they face a penalty. And the penalty starts at about $95 uh, for an individual in 2014 and $47.50 per child uh, or $295 for a family or 1% of the family's income, which is ever greater. Mm -hmm. And then now, it goes up. Is that up. for all economic groups? Yes. Uh -huh. And then it goes up in 2015 and goes up again uh, to a higher number in 2016. Okay, so in other words, there is a, if, if come January 1st, 2014, if you don't have, if you're not covered by some form of medical insurance, you get penalized. Correct. You have to pay a penalty. Okay. Now, what are the mechanisms if, if right away somebody says, to hell with it, I'm not going to pay that, what happens? Uh, the way I understand it's going to be enforced is it's going to be monitored and enforced through the IRS. Mm -hmm. And so when you file your tax return, it's going to ask you whether or not you've got health care and provide some evidence of that. And if you don't, the IRS will levy, levy a penalty. Okay. Let's talk for a moment about sort of the, the, the folks who are on the lower economic rung of the ladder. Mm -hmm. the people who are on public assistance and welfare. Yes. Are they subject to the same 
kind of penalty? Um, I honestly don't know. I believe that if you are at the uh, federal poverty level or below, you may not be subject to that penalty. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's get back talking about the, uh, uh, about the, the, the uh, Good Thrift Benefits Corporation. First of all, it's a great name. Thank you. It's a great name. And your, um, your position of having um, a mission of doing social good while also turning a profit is certainly a noble one. Tell me, please, some of the kind of things that you're involved in and how you're making people's lives better. Well, to begin with, what we've set out to do is we know that there's a lot of confusion about uh, the Affordable Care Act. Yes. And particularly among employers. One of the aspects of the Affordable Care Act that virtually no small and medium-sized employers knew about before I started talking to them about it was the requirement to provide a notice and education to their employees about the new health insurance marketplace and exchanges that are opening up on October 1st. Right. And to provide that notice in writing to their employees by October 1st. Mm -hmm. And when this- so I just kind of want to repeat that here. So yes. employers are required by the law, by that law, to notify their employees of what? About the health insurance marketplace and exchanges that are opening on October 1st. Okay, and most, and you're, what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is most employers didn't even know that. That's correct. Until you started to talk about it. So, you know, we could call you a pioneer here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure about that. Well, you're blazing new trails, but, at least, you know, informing and educating a lot of, of the uninformed and uneducated about this particular bill. Well, we felt, we felt it was important to do that. A, because they didn't know about it, they were confused, they faced a penalty if they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Labor, about 10 days ago, uh, decided not to levy that penalty against employers who did not provide the notice on October 1st, but they're still required to do it. And the government is relying on employers to let their employees know that if you don't have health insurance or if your cost of the insurance that I provide to you as an employer is exceeding 9.5% of your income, mm -hmm. you can go on to the uh, exchanges that are opening up on October 1st right. and shop for a plan that might cost you a lot less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't have coverage now, it's a good way to shop. Right. And if you are paying a lot for your insurance now, let's say you have insurance, but sure. you're paying an arm and a leg like a lot of people are. Sure it's gonna be a good opportunity for individuals to shop for a much more affordable plan. And the real new thing here is that they may qualify for a tax credit that they can put towards their premium to lower their cost of the, of the health insurance. And it's remarkable. Some of these tax credits, and I've run some numbers and we can talk about this as examples. I would like to, sure. It's just remarkable. And Can you, know, you, can you give an example or two? Yes, absolutely. Um, So first, let me say that um, there's a place where individuals and small business owners can go to find what's called a uh, premium subsidy tax calculator. Right. And we actually have one on our website. Okay. Um, Please feel free to give that information out. I mean, because, again, all week long, I've told my viewers, my listeners, and folks that follow me on, on Facebook and, and Twitter that we're going to be sharing information that is going to be impactful for them. So don't be bashful about... You know, if your place is one of the sources where they can get this information, let's not be bashful about, about sharing it. Okay, I'd be okay. pleased to. Sure. Well, maybe we should start with that. Um, I'm going to hold up our website address because folks can tune into this, and if you uh, get to this website, you can follow the discussion as I'm Good talking. Good-thrift.com. Yes. ACA 71441. Telephone number. 410-934-0858. Folks, this is material to you and to your, to your economic situation. Pay attention here. So let me just explain. Um, you can access our website in two ways. First is you can go to good-thrift.com or you can text ACA to this number, 71441. Okay. Two ways to access it. And once you're there... Uh, we want to talk about this subsidy calculator. Yes. If you go to the page 
that says employees, and I'll just show you a little picture of our, our website. This is, is what it'll look like when you land there. Okay. And along the top here, you'll see employees. If you click on employees over on the right-hand side, you're going to see a picture of a tax credit subsidy calculator that looks like this right here. It's this, it's this blue one. Mm -hmm. Now, the Kaiser Family Foundation is the, are the ones that have made this calculator available. It's also available on their website. And when you go to our website and click on that calculator, the picture of the calculator, it'll take you to the Kaiser Family Foundation website where the calculator resides. Uh -huh. Once you're there, it allows you to put in information about what state you live in, what your income is, how many people are in your family, how many adults, how many children, what the ages of the adults are, and whether or not you smoke. And then it will tell you about what you'll pay for a health insurance plan that is um, what they call the silver level. And they break it into four levels, and they call them metal tiers. Mm -hmm. So it starts at bronze, right. where you pay, basically pay 40% of your cost of health care. Uh, the My baby drives a pro handcuff. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant markdown madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy Shalal. I'm the owner of Bus Boys and Poets. Welcome back to the Rock Newman Show today, Saturday, September the 28th, 2013. My guest uh, in studio at the Langston Hughes Room from Bus Boys and Poets is Michael Nathans. Coming up in the next hour will be Kimberly Worthy, a 2009 District of Columbia Teacher of the Year, and someone that's going to talk to us about educating her children uh, and educating your children, preparing kids in a way to be qualified for almost something that it's considered to be like a grand prize, to be eligible to go to Harvard University tuition free. Who out there might want that? And then in the last hour, we're going to have Stacy Ann Chin, the poet and political activist, spoken word artist extraordinaire. But right now, we're going to come back to Michael Nathan. Um, Michael, before we went to break, um, we touched on, uh, uh, talked about how uh, folks could listen in here now, find out about how their credit works, how they can make it better. You also have, and I told them there was a toolbox in their future, um, a shoebox in their future. And, but you also have information for employers. That's correct. Can you share that with us? Uh, absolutely. The uh, October 1st requirement for employers to provide this notice to their employees and education about the health insurance marketplace and exchanges is something very few employers knew about right. and are completely unprepared to deal with. So as part of our mission as a B Corporation, we put together a toolbox for employers that has all the forms they need and all the information they need all in one place for them to provide the notice and education to their employees 
about the health insurance marketplace and exchanges. And, and, and folks, again, those of you out there who, who have businesses, who are, who are running businesses, this is something so incredibly important. You know, we cannot put our head in the sand. This is upon us. This time is upon us. I, for one, strongly believe that this is something that at the end of the day is going to have a great positive impact on this country, that it is going to spare families and businesses the disaster that, they, that, that, that happens to them when they are hit with these big health maladies. Um, so listen up. Now, we're gonna, let's, can we get to? Just, just one second. Okay. I just want to say that this, this toolkit for employers. Yes has a lot of resources to help them comply with the October 1st date, which is coming up quick. Yes. But even if they miss that date, it's better to provide that notice, even if they provide it late, than not provide it at all. Right. And we make the toolkit available to employers for no charge. For no charge, it's free. It's on our website. When you go to our website, it looks like this. Go to the employers page. And when you hover over the, your, your mouse over the employer's page, yeah. you'll see the ACA resource and toolkit. Right. It's password protected. So send us an email, uh, fill out our contact form, and we'll send you the password. You'll be able to get in, have access to the toolkit. And then in addition, on our website, on the employer's page right here, you'll also see an, a, um, a webinar for employers right. that's pre-recorded. We have a 30-minute version and a 60-minute version where employers can actually hear the instructions about the October 1st notice requirement and how to use all the documents in this toolkit here. So we try to make it self-serve, but we're also willing to talk to employers and particularly meet with employers that would like our help. And we can meet with employers regardless of where in the country they're located. Yeah. We have a team that can be on, on site you know, with a with a, a day or two notice. You know, you said with without charge, and that's obviously an an, an incredible service. Someone ha has the question, and that someone would be me. Um, so, like, what's the catch? I mean, you you say, well, you know, you, you you're doing all of these good things. You do this here, and at the end of the day, what becomes the benefit to the Good Thrift Benefits Corporation beyond just good service? How do you how do you how do you make the cash register ring? Yes, great question. Um, we know that the leading cause of bankruptcy in this country is from uh, people missing paychecks from accident and illness. Senator Elizabeth Warren, while she was a professor at Harvard University, did a study, Harvard Law School, Harvard Medical School, and found that even people who had insurance were going bankrupt when they had a serious accident or illness that prevented them from work. Right. Because your health insurance does not pay your, cover your, your missing paychecks. Sure, sure. The payments go to doctors and to the hospital and to the providers to pay those bills. Right. But while you're out of work and your pay is not coming in, how many paychecks can the average American afford to miss right. before they can't pay the rent, buy the groceries and that sure. sort of thing? Sure. So what we specialize in is making supplemental benefits to plug those holes in major medical health programs right. available to employees through employers where the employee gets a 40% discount on the premium and gets to pay the premiums pre-tax. So the total discount to the employee winds up being close to 50% on these policies right. that are used to cover their income in the case of accident or illness. And for employers, it's a wonderful way to offer better benefits to their employees, right. particularly if they don't offer health insurance. Right. Because the employer doesn't pay. Sure. The employee sure. pays. Yes. And they get the, the discount that they get on these plans is it's almost like an employer giving an employee a raise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Folks, uh, you know, in, in, in layman's language, and, you know, maybe I don't need to do this, but I'm so... I'm so intrigued by what, by what Michael Nathan is talking about. Here's the deal. So you get this supplemental insurance. You get it at nearly a 50% discount. And if you're injured or if you're sick and you have health insurance, okay, that's good. Let's say you're health, you've got wonderful health insurance and it takes care of all of your health-related problems. But if your health-related problems cause you not to be able to work, and to take care of your family, this particular insurance kicks in and takes care of your family, gives you the money to pay your mortgage and put food on the table and clothes on your kids' back. 
for l about half of what you ordinarily might pay. This is the kind of information on the Rock Newman Show that we want to share with you. This is critical. This is not some out-in-the-weeds gobbledygook. This is real to you in your lives. Michael. That's exactly right. So that's how we make money. For okay. We help employers provide these supplemental benefits to their employees, the employees. It's a very affordable way. Yeah. Uh, these policies are so affordable, and it's just a wonderful way to, in a fiscally responsible way, yeah. to protect their family and to protect themselves and to protect their assets. Right. So, you, again, you're, you're, you're doing well while you're trying to do some good. Look, exactly. I had so many people to respond to me. I, when I put out on Facebook, I've, I've got my sort of personal limit. I've got 5,000 friends. Man, I'll, most people do not like to put their sort of negative news out publicly. Mm. You know, you always see, yes. the good, see, see the good stuff. Yes. My inbox was loaded up. My private box was loaded up when I talked about people being able to improve their credit and there being hints to be able to help your financial situation by more solidly building your credit, having good credit, knowing what to, knowing what to, to do to try to get better loans and that sort of thing. And yes. most people are lost. They don't understand the credit reporting or anything else. Help us out. Well, it's a very interesting connection between insurance and credit. If you stop and think about it for just a second, let's say you're a lender, or let's say you have an apartment that you want to rent out, and you have two applicants standing in front of you, and they both look the same in terms of their credit score. They both have maybe not such a perfect credit score. Let's say they have a 650 FICO score, mm -hmm. and they both have the same amount of What's income. the top credit, credit score you can get? 850 on the FICO scale. Oh, 850. Yes. And where do you start? I mean, was you are just ain't never paid a bill in your life <laughs> that you owe, and you owe a whole bunch. What, what's the where's the what's the floor? Well, the interesting thing is, a lot of people pay bills that are very common, right. like electric and cable and phone and even rent right. that could be reported to a credit bureau, but in many cases aren't reported. Uh -huh. But they're paying these bills. So I'm just saying, give me a number though. I mean, if there is one, 850 is the, sort of your best score. The number is zero. zero. Wow. So meaning, so, uh -huh. meaning no credit. What, really what that means is you have no debt, mm -hmm. but you're paying you may be paying regular bills. I you may see. be paying five or six or seven regular bills on time right. every month, which, by the way, are classified as credit under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Okay. And these bills could be reported to a credit bureau, and in some cases they are. They are, equal, but in many cases they're not. Equal, unless you're equal Credit Opportunity Act, which makes sure that there's no discrimination, supposedly that there's no discrimination, that sort of thing. Yes, okay. but there are other parts of the act that we'll talk about in just a second that are a lot of people call the best kept secret in financial services. We want to know the best kept secret in financial <laughs> services. Can you tell us now? <laughs> patience, patience. Okay. We're building up to it. But my, my point was when you have two credit applicants and they're both standing in front of you and they both look the same, otherwise maybe a 650 FICO score right. for each, each has equal income, equal assets, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But one has health insurance and the other doesn't. And maybe one has an accident disability in, in the uh, policy that protects their income right? and the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. Which one would you rather rent your apartment mm -hmm. to? Mm -hmm. The one that got that stuff through Good Thrift Benefits Corporation? Well, at, <laughs> at, 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 nearly, at nearly half the price. <laughs> Whether it comes through us or not, the point is that somebody with a disability uh, insurance policy to protect them sure. and protect their income and sure. frankly to help pay the rent yes. or to help pay the financial obligations if they're missing work right. would typically be the more credit worthy of the two applicants. Right. The problem today is that those kinds of policies don't get reported to the credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. And this is where the Equal Credit Opportunity Act comes in. Uh, it's again, there's this uh, section in the act, it's buried deep, which is why you haven't heard about it right. and the viewers haven't heard about it. And frankly, very few uh, bank regulators had heard about it until I approached them to talk about it. Right. But it's uh, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Regulation B, Section 1002. Listen, folks, listen. Okay. Section 
It used to be 202. Right. And when the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB, took over responsibility for overseeing the act, they changed the numbering just a little bit. So it changed from two, Section 202 to 1002. Okay. Point six B6. Uh-huh. So you can see how deep in the act this is buried, which yes. is why a lot of folks haven't heard about it. But the other reason they haven't heard about it is lenders really don't want consumers to know about this. Right. Why? Because it allows an applicant to take their shoebox full of the receipts that they have for I told their, you there was a shoebox in your future. Here's mine. Yes. It allows a, a consumer to put all the bills that they pay... Uh, every month, for example, let's see what we have here. Here's my uh, my electric bill, um, uh, <clears throat> my um, this is my utility bill, uh, my phone bill, my cable bill. Uh, I happen to pay a mortgage, but some people might have rent. Uh, all their bills, and everyone has these bills, right. even if they don't have a credit history. Right. Um, I happen to and have. So, what do you you are to take these bills and do what? Show, how, how does that benefit you? Show them to to a lender, right? And tell them about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the fact that the law requires the lender to consider this payment history or face a ten thousand dollar fine. So, in other words, if you have that six hundred and fifty credit score, for example. And, it, and two yes. people are there. Let's go back to that. They, they're two there, and everything is kind of, they're, they're equal across the board. Yes. But if one of us comes in and has this kind of information here to show a history of good payments that is not at the credit bureau, the lender is obligated by law to take this into account? Correct. Or face a $10,000 penalty. Folks, get those shoeboxes together. <laughs> now, this is a lot for consumers to remember. Um, so what I've done is I've published a guide called, called Shoebox, Shoebox Credit. Credit. Three steps to take before your next credit or employment application. Correct. And you say, or employment application. Why is that important? Employers consider your credit history in some cases before they'll hire you. And if you don't have a credit history but you pay your bills on time, you can use that evidence with an employer to show, hey, look, you know, I... I'm financially, I'm fiscally responsible. I, I pay my bills on time. Even though I don't owe any debt, I don't have any debts to anybody, um, which you may think because I don't have a credit history, I'm, I've got bad credit. Right. Or at least that's how lenders treat you if you don't have a history. It's like having bad credit. But if you can show that you pay your bills on time, and if you can show you have a disability policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can show you have an accident policy, if you can show you have a, a sickness policy, those are the kinds of things right. that when you show a lender this and you've gone to the trouble to put it together right. and organize it for a lender, mm -hmm. and our guide gives you uh, tips on how to create a list of these things on a piece of paper in addition to your actual evidence, mm -hmm. and you present that to a lender, a lender is going to say, this is not my ordinary applicant. This person is organized. Right. They are informed. They know about the law. Sure. But they're paying attention to their finances. And that's, frankly, the kind of borrower I'd prefer to work with. Yeah. Michael, let me ask you. We've got a minute left. Um, what would you say, you know, you are a wealth of information, a, a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for coming on the show here today. I, hopefully, you know, folks have paid attention to what you've had to say. It's sort of as a wrap-up, talking to the individual, whether it is, you know, if you can combine the Obamacare and the credit, give me sort of a one-minute speech that makes you the greatest person in the world. <laughs> Pro uh, what makes me the greatest person in the world is my wife, that's who's sitting over here. Uh -huh. uh, but <laughs> Speaking about political correctness and right correctness. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say that there's a, a lot of information on our website. I would encourage visitors to go to good-thrift.com. Uh -huh. Whether you're an employer, you can access our toolbox for the Affordable Care Act there. Right. Um, you can contact us. We'll provide consultation to you. Uh, you don't have to buy anything from us for that. Right. We do that for free. Mm -hmm. We can help you offer supplemental benefits to your employees to make them happier and more financially secure and give them a good price uh, it's almost like giving them a raise. Right. And then we can, for, for individuals and employees, they can go onto our site and learn how to use supplemental benefits 
by just by watching a video on how to protect their income and learn about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Regulation B, and find the Shoebox Credit Book. And they'll also find a discount coupon on our website for the book so they don't have to pay retail. When I leave here today, I'm going to good-thrift.com. Thank you so for much for appearing on The Rock Newman Show. Thanks for having Folks, me Folks, thank you for watching. Uh, coming up, Washington, D.C., 2009, Teacher of the Year, talking about your children and how you might prepare them for a better future by getting a better education, how you might prepare them to be prepared to accept a uh, entrance into Harvard University tuition free. Stay tuned. We'll be right back in a few moments. Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from The Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland of Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor. This is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to 4700 Advertisers, the DMV's greatest corporate citizen, 
Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Pohanka Automotive Group. If you have any automotive needs whatsoever, if you want to sell your car, buy a car, trade in your car, have your car serviced, whatever you need, see my good friends at the Pohanka Automotive Group. You will be well taken care of, I promise. I'm Rock Newman. I might be there. Come on down and see our good friends at Pohanka Automotive Group. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Folks, welcome back to The Rock Newman Show. Today is September the 28th, 2013. We are broadcasting live from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. Um, come on down. We've got two more hours of great programming here. And I also want to uh, let you know that tonight at Bus Boys and Poets at 5th and K Street, Northwest Washington, Stacey Ann Chin is performing a fabulous one-woman play. Stacey Ann will be our guest. Stacey Ann Chin will be our guest in the next hour. Right now, we have former DC Teacher of the Year, Kimberly Worthy, joining us. Kimberly Worthy is the kind of impactful instructor that, and teacher in the uh, school system here in Washington, DC that uh, she's gotten accolades uh, for literally from around the world. She spent time in, in South Africa. We were just talking about her many experiences there. Um, the kind of work that she's done has landed her invitations to the White House. I've seen the photos of Kim and Mrs. Obama and President Obama. So we are happy to have here at the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets, Kim Worthy, thank you so much for joining us on The Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Rock. Kim, you teach at the Howard University Middle School of Mathematics and Science. Yes. That's quite a name for a school. You know, we're going to talk about um, what I had informed our uh, viewers and listeners about a little bit, about Harvard University, uh, for some reason, a program that had been established for a while where Harvard was waiving the tuition for uh, the disadvantaged, disadvantaged families uh, for kids who qualified to get in. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But before we go there, I'd like to talk about your, your career at, at, at the Howard University Middle School of Mathematics and Science and just what that is, that is a school that is not technically or otherwise a part of the D.C. school, public school system. Right. This, is a, this is a charter school. Right. Okay. Correct. And when was that founded? Okay. Um, our school was founded in the fall of 2005. Okay. Yeah. Right on Howard's campus across from Founders Library. Now, is that in the, uh, is that in Lock Hall? Is that, is that what is in? Next to Lock Hall. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. And who were the founders of this program, of this school? Um, the founder is um, Dr. Hassan Miner. Okay. And um, he was a graduate of MIT and um, committed to our community here in Washington, D.C. He wanted to provide um, a world-class education for D.C. residents, D.C. students who, um, maybe cannot afford to go to the independent private schools here and receive a world-class education. He um, read the research that shows that if you expose students, especially in the middle school years, um, to rigorous mathematics and science and engineering um, programs, you increase their chances of going into those fields um, later on in life. Um, also research shows that it's in middle school where students kind of make that subconscious decision to uh, possibly drop out if things are getting too difficult right. um, or stay the course. And so he wanted to make sure that um, we provided a uh, world-class education for our students here in Washington, D.C. And would it be fair to say that the Howard University School of Mathematics and, and some Middle School of Mathematics and Science, how does it stack up? against what would what are some of the private schools? Okay, we are um, right up there. Unlike the private schools, um, we have, I think, 80% of our students are free and reduced lunches. Are, are, are what? Free and reduced lunches. Uh-huh. And, um, and so Title I. And with that, many times, um, for a myriad of reasons, yeah. um, 
many of those students come to us um, not having certain skill sets, right. unlike those private schools that get to uh, select their students right. and test in their students. We are a charter school. We cannot select our students. So we get students from all over Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and with all um, levels of skill sets. And um, regardless of those barriers, we take our students. We have a rigorous co um, curriculum, um, emphasis on who we are as a people to give them the, that confidence that they need. And we are competing with uh, these private schools in math counts and solar car competitions and, and other engineering competitions. And we are faring very well. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something that I became aware of. I have two, got, two young God kids, mm -hmm. um, God children, um, Gabriel and Dakota. Mm -hmm. And their mother um, was looking for private schools for them. Mm -hmm. Um, at an early age, and I mean, I had no idea, for example, that there was the kind of testing and even competition that, you know, applied to kids that early. And, um, you know, to find out that the private schools are setting up um, sort of classifications, um, setting up requirements for, you know, kids that young, I think a lot of people not, are, are not even aware mm -hmm. that that kind of competition at the early age exists. Now, when you say you can't, um, you can't select your students, right. what is the process for enrollment? How, does, how do families get their kids into a program like the Howard School? Well, we have an enrollment um, window and um, Parents from all over Washington, D.C. can submit an application, and then we have a lottery system. So once you submit your application, you're given a number. Uh -huh. And then I believe around April, we have a lottery um, right on campus, and parents are invited to come, and we choose your number, and then you're in. So you're in, mm -hmm. and so, so if, a, if a child in the public school system for Washington, D.C., which mm -hmm. certainly has had its fair share of ridicule, mm -hmm. If they're not doing so well, if they if they apply to the Howard Middle School, and you just assign a letter, lottery number, what about their academic requirements? Are there? Do you require? No. Uh huh. No. So you academic. take them. You take them where they are. Where they are. Okay. And then your mission is to say that your school and the teachers therein yes. are good enough and are strong enough to take these. What some would clearly come in as underachievers. Low skill L levels. Low skill. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to make, to give them, to give them high skills. Yes. Yes. Now, what kind, what's, talk to me about the curriculum. Because, you know, I've certainly heard some middle school kids and their parents talk about the workload. That, and, 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 that, and that it's a heavy one. <laughs> Why don't you do this? Walk us through a kid coming into your class, what a kid coming into your particular cl class might, and, and then their parents, what they might expect. Okay, so they will expect um, a lot of discussion, um, high level reading. Um, what is that, high level reading, like what does that equate to? So, for instance, we've read in my class before um, Up from Slavery by Booker T. Washington. Um, usually, typically, a. a and what year? I've done this with sixth graders and seventh graders. Okay. Um, uh, we've read um, Miseducation of the Negro together. Um, we've read books that typically students receive in college. And um, so I do that so that um, to promote critical thinking. So I, I give them very abstract, um, uh, rigorous texts so that we can have discussions and um, Students can share their feelings and their emotions and their perspectives, yeah. and we can engage in um, critical thinking um, discussions. But also, I have to scaffold with the vocabulary. And so I intentionally, intentionally choose high-level books so that I can expose them to certain vocabulary that they may not be exposed to on a regular basis. And so I'm teaching pronunciation. I'm teaching spelling. I'm teaching meaning. Um, context clues so that they can deduce in the future when they're exposed to these um, different vocabulary words, um, which really 
is responsible for that achievement gap that so many people talk about. Um, it's just exposure to certain words and certain things that you may not be exposed to on a regular basis. And so um, vocabulary building is big, and then also um, promoting reason reasoning and logical thinking and so on and so forth. Okay, so mathematics, uh, Howard University uh, mathematics uh, and, um, and science school is not just about mathematics and science. <laughs> it's definitely not a, just about, well, it is, because mathematics and science is everywhere. And so when you come into my classroom, even though I teach history, you will see a lot of science in my room and a lot of mathematics in my room. Um, and I especially focus on um, African and Native people's uh, uh, contributions to mathematics and science. So since I teach social studies, I have a, a, a unique opportunity to bring in um, which is vitally important, mm -hmm. bring in our contributions um, to these fields um, before slavery, before we were brought here, yeah. so that they know we are a continuum of African genius and um, African mathematics and science. We're creating a sense of identity which is invaluable. Exactly. Right, which mm -hmm. unfortunately the school systems I think across the country don't do nearly enough. Not at all, and which is why I teach at this charter school. We uh, we are our own LEA, so we have that autonomy. What, what does that mean, LEA? Uh, actually, the acronym I can't re I don't know, but it's it's basically we are our own school district. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. we are. Um, so not not particularly governed uh, by uh, you know right. a broad consortium of schools that you're a part of. No, you're you're independent. We are independent. And um, which gives uh, teachers the autonomy that we really need to have in order to make sure we are providing um, culturally relevant curriculum, um, providing the social um, pieces that need to be a part of, um, social emotional pieces that need to be a part of our curriculum. Um, spiritually, we can uh, address our students spiritually, identifying them as spiritual beings, ourselves as spiritual beings. Um, and just being able to teach the truth to their spirits because their spirits know yeah. what's going on. They yeah. know the, of the inequalities. They feel them. They see them on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, so when you ignore that, um, you're ignoring their humanity, their experience. Yeah. And so with our autonomy, we're able to teach mathematics, science, and, and Spanish and everything else. At the same time, we're teaching them, I see you. I hear you, I know your experience, you're yeah. not imagining it, yeah. and now I'm gonna teach you your role yeah. as, a, as a political. Because I feel you also. Mm -hmm. You know what, I, I wanna say to the, to the production crew here, what Kim just said, uh, it's on the, my clock here it says 1023, I guess that started maybe at 1022. Capture that, because that is so very, very powerful. That's something that I want to see on my uh, on, on the site. I mean, that was just really so powerful what you just said. Kim, I'd like for you, if you could, um, if something comes to mind, you take these kids in, you take them again, take them in again, regardless of what their test scores might be, what their performance level has been in a previous school. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example or two that stands out where you had a kid coming in that clearly was of a kid that was not doing well, that wasn't achieving well, perhaps was a troublemaker or otherwise, and that you and your team over there were able to work with to help transform them from someone who might have been going south, but you took them in a northerly upward kind of direction. Any, any particular I, one stand out more than the other? I have so many. I am very sensitive, however, because I, I posted this on Facebook. I am Facebook friends with all of my students. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm very sensitive to. Oh, I see. Cause, because I see. the I school see. just opened in 05. Yeah. And I've been teaching there since the first year. Um, so they're all very. Uh huh. Still and much I, I, a part I understand of my that life. answer. I, I, I <laughs> but we, I, I will say in general, yes. generally speaking, yes. in fact, I was just speaking with Karen about um, one particular story, um, but I, I'd just rather not say. But we have, and I have so many stories yeah. where students have come to us um, just ill prepared um, yeah. for many reasons. And um, because of their 
dedication and commitment to our program because our program is rigorous. Yeah. And we it's not a magic show. We can't do it by ourselves. So sure. you have to meet us halfway. Right. And and those students that have committed to meeting us halfway with their parents meeting us halfway. Yeah, yes, yes. We have moved them um, and they are pursuing their dreams right now. We have an after school program I was telling Karen about um, uh, that it's a STEM program from 3.30 to 4.30 every day. So we have robotics. We STEM, have STEM is? Uh, science, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Okay. And so at the end of the day, students choose which clubs they want to be in. And so uh -huh. we have um, toy challenge where they create toys, um, solar car challenges, math counts, um, all sorts of different clubs right. that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so that is really our hook in our school. Yeah. So our students gravitate towards those because it's not the normal class day. Um, it's fun for them. They get to apply the mathematics and the science that they've learned all day and, um, and do some hands-on. And so those students, many of our students that have come, um, you know, with any, whatever issues they've had, it's our STEM program that really ignites their motivation to learn, to succeed, um, I've run a program, mine wasn't STEM based, mine was called Africa's Voice, and it was a girls um, group. And um, That we, was done here? At, at MS Squared, yes. Uh -huh. okay. And so uh, mine wasn't a STEM based per se, but um, it was more of a social justice um, program, uh, um, working with um, teaching, they were responsible for teaching our Howard community about the injustices um, in West Africa, um, in the areas of health care, um, education, um, poverty, so on and so forth. So they came up with all sorts of activities um, and mathematical activities. Um, we had uh, students go around in homeroom and give one out of three students a ribbon indicating how many people are living in poverty wow. in West Africa. So yeah. throughout the day, when you saw that ribbon, you represented that person so they could see the mathematics um, on, the, on their peers. Um, but this program has ignited I mean, major social activists now. Yeah. <laughs> um, one comes to my mind right now. I named her Ayira. I gave all my students African names. And her name was Ayira, which means um, the chosen one. Okay. And um, when we started our program, I went into the hallway to address an issue. I came back and she said, Mama Kim, we have the name of our group. Our group is going to be Africa's Voice. Since no one wants to hear what's going on in Africa, we're going to speak for Africa. Wow. And I was blown away. And again, these were the students that, these were the girls, sure. you know, sure. DC's finest. Yes. <laughs> and I, you tap into their spirits and it just ignites, you know, the beautiful flowers that they are. And, um, and they're all still motivated. Several of us went to Africa that year, to Ghana, um, from our group. And, um, and they email me all the time. I want to go back. Can we please go back? So, um, you know, so our program is a holistic program. It's not just academics, academics, academics. Um, and so we give them a purpose for learning. What is your purpose for learning? Because all of us have a responsibility with this freedom that we have here. And so um, they have to use their, their knowledge and their, their unique skill sets, because yeah. everybody's different. Right. And so you have to use your knowledge, your unique skill sets, and your purpose to give back and to uplift our um, community. Kim, uh, this is absolutely fascinating. You know, you embody, you know, sort of the passion that we think is so much missing from the classroom. Uh, much too often, you know, you, you, you hear of sort of uncaring instructors. And I'm sure, you know, Pete, there are more complaints than probably there are uh, compliments. And it's a, it's a tough job. It certainly is, is a tough job. I've positioned that I think the most important job of a human being on this planet is that of mother. Mm -hmm. Maybe number two is father. Maybe number two is father. <laughs> Tied or certainly a close number three would be that of teacher. What was it that inspired you 
to the level of excellence that you have achieved in the classroom and the kind of commitment, dedication, and passion, uh, passion that you bring to your students? Well, I think it, uh, many contr contributions. First of all, my parents, like you said, mother and father. Sure. And so growing up here in Washington, D.C. Um, with Steve Rickman, I was out protesting and <laughs> marching since <laughs> I was a little girl. So. Um, Literally. Yeah. And um, and so, and that was the norm for me growing uh -huh. up. And um, having to wear uh, balloons, tennis shoes instead of Reebok because Reebok supported um, apartheid. And going to school and, and sharing that, you oh, know, yeah. why I have... Parenting is real, real important. <laughs> yes. And um, so, you know, just my parents instilled a sense of, you know, it's bigger than me. Yes. You know, we are a part of humanity, and we have to um, fight for everyone. Right. We have to. That's our obligation. So on top of that, I went to an African center school here called Roots Activity Learning Center. Yes. And I started going there when I was three and um, until middle school. And Roots provided those non-cognitive factors that research shows is has a stronger correlation to a person's success than your math and verbal scores on a test. And it helps and, <laughs> give the kids roots. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right, and right. so I knew my heritage. I knew who I was. I was proud um, of who I am as an African that was brought here. But knowing my African heritage and being proud of that, knowing the genius of African people, the first people on the planet, like all of that was just, it, it boosted me so much. Yeah. But then not only that, um, she taught, Mama Bernita taught us differently. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kinesthetic, a lot of rhythm. Uh, we, we were just taught differently. But I didn't know this until I went on to Spelman and I took an African psychology course. And I learned the differences between the different groups and how they learn, their epistemological styles and how the different values of the different groups play out in the school and the logic system, how you, the, your worldview. Mm -hmm. So when I saw, when I learned all of this in this African psychology course, I literally blurted out in class, like, this is how I was taught at Roots. Yeah. Like, I can give you practical examples of how this works. Absolutely. And, um, and so then later on, um, I took a course, ad Advocacy for Urban Schools, and had to do student teaching in Atlanta at Southside High School. And it was just magical. I had no training, and lesson, writing lesson plans came naturally for me. Interacting with the students, empowering the students, it, it was just such a natural fit. I knew I wanted to do it. And then when I got into the public school system, I started teaching in Brooklyn, New York. I saw why or how public schools were doing a disservice to children yeah. of different cultures. Yeah, you know what, and that's a strong statement to say public school systems are doing a disservice, but it's, it's, it's one that I understand why you make, and you know, when we observe it, and we, we observe, when we observe the dropout rate mm -hmm. and so many other maladies that afflict our young children, children especially, especially minority children, uh, it is a statement that's hard to challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're going to, uh, I can't challenge this clock here, so we've got to take a quick bra uh, break. We'll be back with DC Teacher of the Year, Kim Worthy, in just a few moments on the Rock Newman Show from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets, 14th and D Street, Northwest Washington, DC.
baby drives a pro handcuff. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant markdown madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. Uh, our guest this hour is Kimberly Worthy, DC Teacher of the Year, um, someone that has been recognized uh, in every level of the educational tier, someone who has visited the, the White House. Um, I understand you were at the White House one time, and uh, <laughs> you, Kimberly, um, the world traveler, urbane, confident sister that you are, got there and kind of went gaga over Barack Hussein <laughs> Obama. And Mrs. Obama said what? Oh, please. He ain't all that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. He ain't all that. That's what some of the Republicans would want to say, but they wouldn't be saying that very, affection very affectionately. <laughs> um, Kim, you know, for some reason, I saw quite a bit of information coming out of the weekend. I don't know what happened up in, uh, up in, uh, up in Boston, but the talk was about Harvard and uh, something that we know that they had been doing for quite some time. But for some reason, this, um, they made a big push to get the information out, I think, to a wider audience about how Harvard, uh, given certain conditions, uh, they are waiving the tuition for underprivileged, disadvantaged, uh, uh, low income, lower income individuals. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How long has that been going on, one? And two, um, how, tell us how the system works. I mean, it can't be just that they are accepting anyone. So how long has this been going on? And, and, and tell us a little bit about that program that you're aware of. Well, I, I learned of it um, back in 2006. And um, I, I've received several emails from um, people from all over the country um, just sending the information out that this, this uh, program is now available at Harvard, where if you make a certain amount or your parents have this income, you can get free tuition. Um, it's my understanding that you do have to go through the regular application process um, and have the academic um, requirements and so on and so forth. Um, once you're uh, accepted, then they look at the income bracket of your family, and then you can 
possibly get the full free tuition. I don't know much about it, mm -hmm. um, but I do know that it's it has been raised to um, sixty five thousand. So that the so income that the income if it's sixty five or, or below, below, right? Then your child can be qualified from an economic mm -hmm. positioning. Right. However, from an academic uh, requirement, there are certain requirements that are obviously going to be made to go through to get into Harvard University. I, I, yes, okay. I would assume so. All right. Now, so Kim, I, I bring that up because, you know, it sort of highlights something. And I was thinking, okay, you know, if I were, if I were rearing a child and, you know, in a particular income bracket, and that some major, what generally thought of as you know, one of the better universities in the world, uh, by some standards, um, are if they're waiving the tuition, then I want my child qualified. So here's what I want to ask you, and as if you can speak directly to parents that are out there, you're a teacher, you're in the classroom, you see every day when you go to work, the good and the bad of what parents have done. You know, sort of give us a prescription, give us a formula, give the parents a formula for how to best prepare their children for learning. So it is a formula. And of course, um, knowledge and, and certain skills will be a part of that formula. But like I said earlier, the non-cognitive factors play in more. So courage, confidence, resilience, um, the commitment to hard work, um, those are really the factors that contribute to um, a person's success in life, their happiness in life. Um, so it's the non-cognitive factors that we really need to push. Um, many times when there are um, financial deficits, um, I've seen parents who try to overcompensate and, and, and give children a lot, you know, the most expensive shoes, the most expensive clothes, and, yeah. and cell phones, and so on and so forth, when the children have not done anything to earn it. Uh -huh. And so you're teaching them that things come to you in life easy. Yeah and for free, and that's really not how it works that's, out that's here. That's not, not a good thing. And so, um, you know, so teaching children how to be resilient, and as a teacher, I can do that with high expectations in my classroom, a rigorous curriculum, believing that they, they have the ability to, um, to master these skills and to understand and just continuing to support and provide whatever they need to be successful to show them they are resilient so that they can see themselves. Yes, I may stumble and fall, but I will get back up. I will. Um, and then, of course, there's the knowledge piece, and that's why I, I mentioned earlier um, the higher level text reading, um, you know, reading papers and, and, and staying up to date with current events and having those intellectual conversations, staying up to date with current events in the science and technology fields, knowing what's going on around the world, knowing what's going on with our government. We have students here that live in Washington, D.C. and have no idea what's, what decisions are being made or ha were made last week in Congress yeah. um, or downtown in City Hall um, until it's too late. And so, but... Exposure to, you know, what's going on around them. Exposure to vocabulary. That vocabulary piece is big. This country, you know, weighs test scores highly, yes. you know. And, um, and one of the areas that we fall is in the area of vocabulary. So reading comprehension. If our scores are low, many times it's because they don't know the vocabulary. And even with mathematics, the reading problems and, and, and critically analyzing word problems and so on and so forth, that vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary is huge. Um, so reading more. Yeah. Um, Tell me, mm -hmm. um, and we've got a couple of minutes left here, um, what do you find to be the most challenging thing that you have to deal with in the classroom in your profession, one, and two, What's most rewarding? Okay, the most challenging. Hmm, so many <laughs> challenges. Um, most challenging, I guess, would be um, 
having children in my classroom who do not believe in themselves um, and do not believe that they um, are capable of success in any way um, for many reasons. Um, and so trying to overcome that so that they could even attempt to try to work out a problem or to read something, try to overcome that inferiority complex that they've developed over the years um, from society. You almost seem emotional. Does that make you cry? Yeah, it does. It does make me cry when I hear their stories because I begin every year with the same six words, stereotype, prejudice, inequality, internalize, inferiority complex, and reject. And we spend about three weeks on these words and really diving deep into them, pulling out examples from society, from newspaper articles, from reading, from text, from videos that they love, and they act out scenes. And then they tell me personal stories about what they've seen and experienced in the classroom and what teachers have said to them. And black teachers, white teachers, yeah. you know. And, um, and so they developed this. And over the years, and so then when I get them in sixth grade, seventh grade, it's so deeply planted inside of them, it's really difficult. Yeah. Um, and this week, since it's our last week on the words, um, they had to, in class, go to the U.S. Census Bureau website and um, look up five different states, just random states, and um, pull up pop, uh, people, education, um, jobs, financial. There's another category I can't think of. Um, and pull out the inequalities that they see. Yeah. And um, there was this one group in the back, and they were just like, Mama Kim, Mama Kim, how come all these states, the, in the poverty section, it's the white people that are on um, that receive more food stamps and welfare than the black people, and so I said, "So what have you internalized?" I said, "I'm just going to throw that back. At, what have you internalized?" Yeah. That question lets yeah. me know something. Yes. And they said the stereotype that black people are on welfare more than white people. Yeah. Or poorer than white people. Right. I said, "Okay, so you've internalized that." Right. Right. And so they were just like blown away, like. Knowledge really is power. Like, yeah. they had no idea white people sure. were on yeah, yeah, yeah. welfare yeah. or <laughs> anything yeah. like that. Right. No concept of that. Right. Which it plays out in how they, they see themselves. Like, many of our students feel like they are supposed to be in these particular economic groups right. um, because they're black. Yeah. Or they're supposed to joan on each other and make each other feel bad because they're black. It's right. a black thing. Right. Right. Um, so, fighting through all of those misconceptions and stereotypes. Yeah, um, the most challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood, understood. And the most rewarding. And the most rewarding, because in the end, when they, when they are aware, can't stop them then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the Rock Newman Show. We Thank love you, you Rock. Here. I Thank, love you, too. Thank you very much. Okay. Folks, we'll be back in just a few moments on the Rock Newman Show. Stay tuned. Tell your friends to watch also. We've got one more short segment, and then we're coming up with Stacy and the incredible Stacy Ann Chen, uh, performing tonight at Bus Boys and Ports at 5th and K Streets. Be back in a moment. <laughs> Thank you. 
The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant markdown madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Folks, welcome back to The Rock Newman Show. Today, Saturday, September the 28th, we're broadcasting live from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Ports at 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. That voice you hear before uh, me coming on here is the voice of the owner and visionary of Bus Boys and Ports, Andy Shalal, a great, great visionary, someone who has developed uh, the properties uh, Bus Boys and Port to be a, a beacon light, to be a welcoming place for folks from all across the spectrum, whatever, uh, 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 whatever color, creed, whatever you may be, you're welcome at Bus Boys and Poets. He really has created an environment that is singularly the most diverse environment gathering, uh, eating establishment in all of Washington, D.C. and the metropolitan area. And the brand is growing and we love Bus Boys and Poets. And we also love that we're doing live, live streaming here at the Rock Newman Show. Uh, the program is broadcast on WEAC Radio 1480 AM from 6 to 9 in the evening. And doing this live uh, kind of live streaming, we have an opportunity to switch up every now and then. And so we were just talking about the all very important subject of education with DC Teacher of the Year, Kim Worthy. We're gonna be speaking to the uh, poet extraordinaire, uh, Jamaican-born Stacey Ann Chin in the next hour. But we have an opportunity to share a little time with the good brother that has come in from the West Coast, uh, coming in from Los Angeles, originally from Oakland, Mr. Anye Malik. Welcome to the Rock Newman hey, Show. Hey, man, thank you for having me. Thank good morning. Thank you so much for coming here. Tell me, man, what's going on in the world of comedy now? Uh, laughter. Um, you, we hope. Obviously. We well, yeah, hope. <laughs> you, would th you would think that would be obvious, but, you know, sometimes there's the opposite of laughter. But, uh, no, it's, uh, I mean... It, it is as it, it, it it's different than uh, the world was when, you know, uh, the legendary days of comedy where, you know, there are priors and Carlins and people are sitting in theaters uh, totally focused. Nowadays, you know, uh, there are more devices and yeah. there are more distractions. There's yes. this thing called ADHD. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, comedians have to make a more of an impact more immediately. Uh, but there's still, you know, uh, it's still a... a, a an awesome scene, yeah. uh, very untapped. Um, it's 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 very exhilarating time for comedy right now. Well, well, you know, it's interesting. You say it's very exhilarating time because you you just tapped into something. Um, I spent a little time with Richard Pryor. Did you? Uh, yes, indeed. And I think Richard, uh, in 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 my humble opinion, or not so humble opinion, is perhaps the greatest con stand up that I've ever seen. Um, and it. Also, you recognize the difficulty mm -hmm. of comedy. You, oh, yeah. You rec I mean, you know, actors, you know, they go out and, and they play these serious roles. They play these, uh, they play these uh, uh, action-packed thrillers. They mm -hmm. might play something where they're madly in love and they tap into all of those emotions. Mm -hmm. they're, giving a, they're given a role that's trying to make folks laugh. Mm -hmm. And they fall flat on their face. They find it is one of the most difficult things on the planet to do. It is. It's. It's. It's kind of. It is incredibly difficult uh, when you think about you know um, other mediums of performance, uh, music, poetry. Um, 
you know, the notes are already there. You kind of yeah. have your song, you're going to play the song. You yeah. have the notes, you push the notes on the piano, that's the song. That's, yes. We rehearsed it, right. we did it just like this on Tuesday. Sure. We did it at the, you know, the mic check yeah. and everything. Comedy, it's, you know, <laughs> you can't really read from that mental music sheet. Yeah. You can't really... Uh, you can't really go over the same routine. You can. I mean, you have your jokes, your sure. material, but sure. you know, you still have to be there yeah. in the room present. with the people. You have and to be very present. In so, the, all the way in the room. All the, the way in the room. Yeah. There's no backup track. There's no DJ. Yeah. Sometimes there's a DJ, but he just presses play. Yeah. There's no discs. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know why they say DJ anymore. The people just sure. on the, the MP3, you know. But that's a whole other situation. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just you and the microphone and your voice and, you know, uh, the audience knows when you're reading from a mental teleprompter. Yeah. And so you got to get out of that. You have to be there. You have to be, they call it improvisational, but you just got to be there. Yeah. What drew you to the, the craft? That's actually a, a interesting story. I was, um, I was coming from a music studio with some uh, re rapper friends of mine, and we were, uh, we were driving around the streets of uh, Oakland, and... Um, these, these fellas was looking at this this young lady on the side of the road with uh, a lot of tantalization. They was like really excited. The whole car saw this female. They was like, oh my goodness, look at her, look at her. And then I looked, I was like, I don't know, fellas. She kind of looked like Jay Leno to me. And then they thought that was funny. And <laughs> the driver crashed his car laughing at that, at that, uh, at that observation. Um, and then, you know, I was like, wow, if only I had shut my mouth. It wouldn't have crashed. It, the car. it wouldn't have crashed the car. And I was like, "Wow, I should try stand-up comedy, man. If I can, if I can make somebody pay five hundred on the deductible with this insurance, uh, I should be able to. I should be able to get some of that." So you know? it wasn't. So so it wasn't one of those things like sort of as a kid, you knew that's what you. Wanted I mean, I to always do was silly, and I was probably uh, you know I've kind of always been outspoken, and you know yeah. uh, sometimes when I present my opinions in serious spaces, uh, even you know uh, my lighthearted candor has you know has gotten me in trouble a lot of times, uh -huh. uh, which is putting it s so mildly. <laughs> uh, you said lighthearted candy. Yeah. Some aunt, uncle, mama, dad, or somebody said, boy, you're a fool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, um, so you said, you said, you said you're, you, you've always been silly. Yeah, a little silly. I, 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 I have, I, I've said to folks that, that, that know me that, that, that kid lo kids love me. Mm -hmm. Like kid, little kids, they kind of really like love me. Yeah. Because I'm silly as hell. Yeah. People don't. Do people look at this show and some other things and have no idea how foolish I am. Oh yeah. Um, and I can remember a lot of foolish things I've done. You said you're silly. Oh, I'm quite silly. Yeah. So, 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 give me an example of some of your silly. Uh, well, a lot of times I'll ramble. Uh, you know, I'll just. Ramble. Are we or, talking about now? Are we talking about some other time? No, like, I'm just like like when I know I know I'm rambling, and, but I'm uh, not going to stop rambling uh -huh. because why? Why stop just rambling? Keep on rambling. Why? Why? Why not ramble? That's <laughs> kind of fun sometimes to you know you. What am I talking about? But why am I talking? So why, why, why what's stop? the silliest thing you did when you was 14 years old? The silliest thing I did when I was 14. Oh wow. Or 15. Uh, or 15. Uh, goodness gracious. Uh, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> I have to think back, uh, you know. I was I wasn't really into, you know. I don't know. I was just like so a you, silly dude. So did you dude. just become I silly? Just a, I was just a silly individual, like you know. I just didn't, you know. Well, okay. Don't don't put don't put a year yeah, on. I, I mean, wanna. think. How about don't put a year on it? I don't mean, put a year. Yeah. On it. So the silliest, the some of the silliest things I've ever done. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's uh, with you know having your parents get upset, a girlfriend get upset, a boyfriend get upset, whatever it might be. Uh, oh man, uh, <laughs> I actually hadn't thought of the silliest thing. Uh, I'm just, a, you know, I'm just, I just like to to keep things lighthearted. You mm. know, I don't, I'm not like a prankster or anything like that. Okay. Um, but uh, so you're, so there are different styles of of, yeah. of, of humor. You yes. know, some people are very, very physical. Yeah. John Bellucci, you know, yeah. very physical. Samurai saw you very, you know, physical with their humor. What you did you do you embrace a particular style? Uh, I would say it's conversational. Like uh -huh. that's probably where my silliness comes into play. Like we'll be having a conversation, and you think I'm saying something important or silly, and then I, you know, I get this hint or an idea or a notion to to switch it up and you know, th throw some nonsense at you uh, in the mix of some serious uh, of conversation mm -hmm. or, or seemingly serious conversation. And you're like, 
did you just say that it, with that face? Uh, you're not even. <laughs> Tell me this. You've done you've done some stand up. Oh yeah. What is the sort of what's the? Is there a moment when you've done stand up where you're like, God, I bombed on this one, and the flip side of that, where you know you stuck it. And, you know, so what, what, what was the feeling you felt behind sticking it? Uh, well, I can explain the first, the bombing feeling, the feeling of bombing when, when every word that comes out of your mouth is like uh, nails on a chalkboard, it seems like. Like, mm. you can't win at all. This oh, is like, you know, uh, these time. people are not feeling me. I can't, not I'm day. not going to be using the front insurance uh, to this establishment. I'm going to, where's, where's the emergency exits? Yeah. And can I use one now? Yeah. Uh, like you know, when when the when the crowd is not on board, uh, it's almost like you there's nothing you can do. It's yeah. like you know you have uh, your breath stinks, and they can hear how bad your breath stinks on the microphone. Uh, it's like it's like your breath stinks through the speakers. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, hey, <laughs> could you put some gum in the speakers? Because right. this fool is funking it up. Right. Um, F U N K. Mm -hmm. funk. I heard. Uh, uh, but um, on the flip side, flip though, side, on the flip side, when you know when everything is landing, uh, when like when I do really well, it's almost like I'm standing next to myself. Like I'm completely besides myself. Like the you know, all the words are, are landing properly. I'm like standing on top of my own shoulders, looking uh -huh. down on myself, like, uh -huh. wow, look at this fool. Uh -huh. He's 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 about to hit him with this. Yeah. Oh, you gonna hit him with that? Yeah. Oh wow. Right, right, who, right, who right, is right. this dude? Right. Who are right. you? Right. And, and then you exit. Yeah. And, and then you get a, out. Then, then you exit. Yeah. Yeah. Ex ex describe that. that uh, describe that feeling on the exit. When well, you've the done exit that. is way different than when the other the you know sure. the, the bombing exit is like more of a uh it's, it's more of an evacuation. You think of evacuating the building, the premises, yeah. the, the, you know, the killing, which is what we call when we do spectacular, the, sure. the killing exit, you don't exit, you kind of, you know, you, you, you're leaving, but you're standing around. You're hanging around, of, getting yeah, you some can, of that. You're hanging some, around. I'm gonna get some more of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. you're like, hmm, I should leave soon, but you know, I want to, uh, you know, I want to sort of, you know, marvel in the space of what I just did to this room, and you know, it would be, it would be so unfair for me to just depart so rapidly. You have got a, you've got a, you, you have an album coming up. Before we wrap up here, you have an album coming up. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, um, this is the, my second independent uh, produced comedy album. Uh, my first uh, comedy album, Lamb Chopping, is available on iTunes. <laughs> Amazon, wherever digital media is available. Also on uh, my website, AnyeMalik.com, A-N-Y-I-M-A-L-I-K.com. Um, but uh, my follow-up album to that, Laughing While Black, is more of a, uh, it's more of a, a personal um, piece. Um, it's uh, it's going to be dealing with a, a lot, mostly with uh, racial profiling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stop and frisk laws being what they are, and, uh, you know, the kind of the climate on the heels of uh, Oscar Grant and uh, sure. Trayvon Martin and uh -huh. um, the, the, the topic of racial profiling has always been important to me. Um, I've won some awards uh, in journalism. I, I have a background in journalism, uh, freelance, uh, freelance journalism and public media. Uh -huh. And uh, and but most of my contributions in that in that field were uh, sharing my experiences with racial profiling. And right. so. Uh, none of it was funny, though, you know, none of it, it was all, you know, very produced, edited, and so by the time a lot of my pieces aired and people heard my, some of my opinions, they didn't really get the full, you know, they didn't get the, f the full story. They didn't, yeah. get, they didn't get the whole deal. They, 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 a, lot of, they, a lot of times they definitely didn't get the real. Uh, and so, um, you know, none of it was funny, though. Yeah. And so this, this coming up project, I want to not only make make light of my own situations and the climate because you know just because it's you know just because uh -huh. uh, african americans and and uh, people of color get unfairly targeted by law enforcement agencies doesn't mean we can't laugh about it right. you know right. it doesn't mean it can't be funny and, and we you can't point out the humor. absurdity uh, the absurdities and the injustice in a, the meantime. a lot of it is quite absurd and yeah. some of it is, is so absurd that it has to be funny sometimes it's so serious the pendulum swings in the other direction it's like really fellas like you know and and, and besides just making fun of the topic i also want to raise awareness that you know there's this document called the certificate of release that people are supposed to get if you're ever detained yeah. uh if you're, if you're ever detained and not arrested, which happens a lot of times, uh, a lot of brothers and people I know um, get handcuffed, sat on the curb, yeah. 
and then they kind of let you go as if to say, all right, well, bye, thank you, sorry, I knew you weren't the, 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 the thug we were looking for, but uh, just doing our job, bye, I and mean, you can be like, hey, well, I know you're just doing your job. I really appreciate that. And I got to do my job here. Okay. I'm, With certificate I'm of release. Clock. That's what a certificate of release, but we want to welcome you back. Thank Folks, you. look Great. out for Laughing Wild Black from Anya Malik. Thank you so much for uh, joining hey, us for at the Rock me. Newman Show. We'll be back in just a few moments with the incredible, incomparable Stacey Ann Chen. is here and no matter what the weather's like outside you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant markdown madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year 100,000 mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back to The Rock Newman Show. September the 28th, 2013, from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets. I am absolutely thrilled to have the person in studio that with me that I've been telling you for the last two weeks that's going to be joining us, the incomparable Stacey Ann Chen. Stacey Ann Chen, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. We love you up in her. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Rock Newman. Thanks for having me. You are most welcome. Uh, Stacey is performing tonight at Bus Boys and Poets in 5th and K Street. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is you waited too long to get your tickets. The show is sold out. And as a, as a, as a promoter of sorts, I certainly was a former promoter, still a little bit, there is no two words better to a promoter's <laughs> ears than sold out. Stacey Ann Chen sold it out in a matter of hours. It always happens when she comes to Washington, D.C. That's D.C. for you, man. That's because you are just fabulous. <laughs> and I said incomparable. And I don't throw that word around lightly. Your body of work has just been so incredibly tremendous, so impactful. That's why you sell out, because people love you. You should just keep talking. I'm not going to say anything. Don't say You're nothing. doing a great job. It's a great show. I love this show already. <laughs> you do. You love me. I love you. When, I love you. I love well, you. Well, let me tell you something. I had a poet on here one time before. Oh, God. Somebody you might have heard of. All right. Her name was Nikki Giovanni. Oh, my God. I wonder and, if she's single. She want to marry me? Well, here's it's the legal thing. now, you know. Here's the, I know. It's legal. It's just New Jersey. Uh, no, state. but the federal rights is all, like, up in it now. So, like, you know, the states can't do anything but follow. Before we go too far <laughs> from sort of what the punchline was going to be, <laughs> she gave me a kiss on the lip. Really? She did. Yeah. She gave me a kiss on the lip. I wonder if she would give me a kiss on the lip. I was wondering if, if the I would last give you? poet that... Either would give me a kiss on the lip or my wife a kiss on the lip. And I'm saying that because she already put in her, she already put in her dibs. She I'm thinks, lo I'm looking she at the, I'm looking at the wife. It's not hard here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she thinks you're about the finest poet she ever seen. <laughs> She's not too bad looking herself. I'm looking at her. <laughs> She's a pretty thing. She's a very attractive woman. And, you know, I mean, did she kiss Nick and Giovanni on the mouth? You know what? We've been talking about that. All right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, Stacey Ann Chen. Stacey Ann Chen. You know, oftentimes, when my guests sit there, a part of what I try to share with them mm -hmm. is that I'd like for my listening audience, for my viewing audience, to become not just aware of the work and all the good things you're known for, but who the person really is. And I saw something, uh, I read something, mm -hmm. that I saw, thought was so fascinating, that the person that sits here today in all of her splendor and brilliance and beauty is a person that was born prematurely. Yes. Yes, I was born at six months or six and a half months. You know, back in those days and in rural Jamaica, you didn't really have, you know, people counting the, the, the weeks and the months since pregnancy. So, um, yeah, I came a little early. I was a little small. And, you're, and, and no one knew that your mom no, was No, my mother pregnant. kept it a secret. She's a very poor woman who I don't think she wanted a second child. Um, she was very poor and didn't have resources for a family. And a second child on the way, and she, I don't think she wanted to be pregnant. And she didn't quite know how to figure out what to do about it. And so she just kind of kept it quiet, and she was a small woman, and the pregnancy didn't necessarily get large. And out popped Stacey Ann, Christmas morning, 1972, 40 years ago. A and gift, now. a gift, a <laughs> gift to the world on Christmas Day. Thank you, thank yes. you, thank you. Um, tell me about growing up in Jamaica, your first memory if i could take you back my first memory i mean i i uh, you know i wrote this memoir so um it, 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 you you have all these memories that you kind of conjured up and pulled from places i think the earliest memory i have is the s smell of my grandmother's hands she's cooking she's handling me and her hands smell like onions and scallions and curried chicken and, you know, there's stew peas. I, I don't know, but it's just yeah. her hands cooking and she's, uh -huh. you know, she's, she's 
she's she's an ample woman, you know, so I'm kind of like, I don't know, her hands on me. I think that's a very early, it's like a flash of memory, yeah, not yeah, necessarily yeah. an episode, but yes, a, a photo, a feeling, yeah. a, a, yeah. a, a, a something that tells me where I begin, you know? Yes, 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 yes. And so early childhood, go to school regular with regular kids, mm -hmm. well, five, six, seven years old? No, I think we we start. I started school at two because my brother started at four, and there was a big scene on the um the, the the steps of the school where I held on to his leg and was like biting and screaming like, "Is my brother? Is my brother?" And yeah. he, you know, so they had to let me stay. So <laughs> <laughs> I was at school uh -huh. at two, uh -huh. um, kind of learning. So you was raising hell early on. Well, I don't know if I was raising hell. I mean, you know, don't start nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't tell people, don't lies about me. Rock me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm a very, like, you know. Don't start no S. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, were you a troublemaker in school? A troublemaker? You say you use these words. Why, yeah. you, sound like, why you sound like the, the conservative right wing? Because mm -hmm. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. Go with me. Troublemaker. I think that I always knew that things were, according to Howard Zinn, topsy-turvy. Uh -huh. You know, Howard Zinn says, I begin with the notion that the world is topsy-turvy. And you're trying to make you just, just help everybody get it straight. I, you know, I know I, there's a whole bunch of people trying to get it straight. I just wasn't connected to them. So it looked like just me. Yeah. But I, there's a whole bunch of people trying to get the world right side up. You know. Uh -huh. It, it, it's crazy, like the way that you know boys have to do this, girls have to do this. Black people should be like this. White people should be like this. I think you know. I think I think people should just you know let up a little bit. You know, loosen up on their tightness, so to and, speak. And at that at that early age, sort of the formative years. Mm -hmm. What was what was fun for Stacey Ann Chin? What, 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 what do you? Look I back liked at? poking at the people who thought they. At, who thought that there should be no argument about how things were. <laughs> so I remember just kind of poking at people and asking them questions about the Bible. Like, yeah. where, why are there no Jamaicans in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. Why are no Jamaicans? Uh -huh. And do angels wear brassieres? Uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, like, uh -huh. I'm, these uh -huh. things... Especially if they got big breasts. I, you know, I mean, you know, I, I never knew if they had breasts because, you know, the pictures of them, you right. know... I don't know. They just had gowns, these big gowns on. And I was curious as to about what might be going on underneath the gowns. And the kind... <laughs> <laughs> that was priceless. <laughs> Let me tell you where the kindred spirit is. I'd be like, Ma, why are we going to this Catholic church and they talking Italian and we can't understand nothing that they saying? Why are we up in here genuflecting and, and getting up and down and a whole bit? So, so, you know, sort of challenging. Yes, I think, I think the whole story is contained in the fact that you say Italian. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You loved poking fun at those folks. Yes. You know, just people who, 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 who were very sure about the way things are, the mm -hmm. way things were, and the way things should be. Mm -hmm. I would always ask questions, you know, like, I don't know, like, what makes this wrong and mm -hmm. what makes that right? And, you know, how come nobody brought back any photos of God? I mean, how come we don't really have any real photos of him, just this kind yeah. of arbitrary drawing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, I would always ask those Ken questions. Kindred spirit again. I'm telling I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait for you to get here. I read your stuff. I read you. I couldn't wait for you to get here. So in the afterlife, you and I might be on the same plane. We just might be. We just might be because, because I asked sometime when I was about seven years old. Mm. I had had surgery. I had emergency, sur uh, uh, emergency surgery. My appendix sac burst. Mm -hmm. The toxins got into my bloodstream and blinded me. Jesus. And so I was like that for two or three days. Now, I'm running around thinking it's cool. <laughs> you know. So, but afterwards, I asked my father one day, I said, well, what makes that a tree? Suppose somebody said that that tree was a popsicle. Mm -hmm. So how did that get defined? So mm -hmm. when I became aware of you and that you were coming here and started reading some of your stuff, I couldn't wait for you to get here. I can't wait to take this break and come back so we can talk some more. On The Rock Newman Show with Stacy and Chen, the incomparable one. All right. How do you manage this?
this is Leprechaun Tim Pohanka from Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose, I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nice or newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nice or newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. With my For The People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nice or newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POHANKA, visit Poanka Nissan and Poanka Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks, in the studio with me. And I'm so happy that she is here. I was so looking forward to this, the incomparable Stacy Ann Chen. Stacy Ann Chen, there, first of all, we could do a three-hour show, and it would go by in 20 minutes. I do believe that. That, that might be true. That's, like, real. Um, so much, so rich. Tell me about working... Um, Tell me about work with deaf, uh, deaf poetry with Russell Simmons. You know, um, I had just come from Jamaica. <clears throat> Young, barefoot, angry, just, you know, I'd left Jamaica because it is illegal to be gay there, and I was, you know, wanting to chase some women without people chasing me. Mm -hmm. Did you say it was illegal? It was illegal. It is so, illegal so, still. So, so sanctioned by the government yes, is it is illegal. against the law, and, yeah. uh -huh. they, you know, it's on the books, you know, um, the international community has been pressuring Jamaica, and there have been some changes, but it's still very dangerous. And uh, anyways, so I left that life. I came to the U.S., where I thought I would land into a, like, you know, a meadow of lesbians in New York City. I don't know. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. I, I imagined myself, you know, kind of like flitting through the streets of New York and just kind of like, you uh -huh. know, communing with lesbians. I don't know. Uh -huh. But when I got there, I discovered racism. Wow. I was like, oh, Jesus. Tell man. me about that. Tell me about it. I don't know. You know what was the first thing? What, what's just stuff like being followed in the stores, stuff like, you know, you would say to someone, oh, can I see that? And they say, oh, it's $150, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, so it's classism mixed with racism. Yeah. Um, and also just, just, just looking at the terrain of New York, seeing who lived where, what sorts of foods were available to them in that neighborhood, right. um, you know, the transportation systems, just, you know, just access, people, schools, just looking at it going like, my God, like all the people of color are under tremendous duress, you know, like economic duress, what, whereas the people who seem to be doing well are largely white people. Yeah. I was like, oh, Jesus, this is an interesting change because, you know, I imagined myself kind of like sliding into a community where I would be like lesbian and great and everybody would be fabulous and it's free, you know, give mm -hmm. us us free in America. <clears throat> so um, when I discovered that problem of racism and, of course, classism in New York, um, I got very angry because I felt as if I had kind of left everything. I had picked up myself and moved to New York and... I was supposed to, I was, I was owed something like, you know, good and a good life or whatever without all of this trauma. Right. And I kind of knocked about with the poets, you know, in the, in the late 90s, you know, the, the, the poetry was kind of flowing and going <coughs> crazy. And I ended up, you know, in the New Rican Poets Cafe and Bar 13 and the poetry slam scene. And, I, you know, it was where you could like talk about inequality and you could rage and you could, you know, commune with other folks who were of uh, like mind and you could, you know, for three o'clock in the morning, you could go have eggs and bacon and, you know, rail and rant about the, the, the status of the world. And you felt like you weren't crazy for feeling all you felt and became a poet. Yeah. Became a performance okay. poet. So 
you, you, you tapped in and, and you and, just expressed. So and then Russell was, Simmons was yeah. doing this show. He yeah. wanted to take the poetry movement was kind of blowing up and yeah. he wanted to get this kind of like um, UN collection of poets and put them on Broadway and put them on HBO. Yeah. And uh, they gave me a call and I said yes. And, and it, was, it, was, it was an amazing time in my life. It was, we were on Broadway, we won a Tony. It was a very exciting time. Um, you know, I think it kind of pushed me into, into being able to, to make a living, a real living. You know, people, right. you know, will invite me in to speak and I will come and speak and, and I can paid, make a living. You get paid for it. I mean, my rent yeah. is paid in New York largely, you know, yeah. mostly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so I'm, you know, I'm, I, I can eat, you know, and I can buy diapers for my kid. Right. Um, I, I want to I want to stop. Um, you were feeling that sort of rage, mm -hmm. you know, sexism, I mean, racism, and sexism, cla classism, everything. sexism, and all of that. You brought with you rage. Yes, you yes. You brought with you rage yes, from yes. Jamaica. Yes, because I'd had a really bad experience there. I'd been attacked by about a dozen boys in a bathroom for being gay. And so when I came here, I kind of had all this balled up stuff. So when I came here and I kind of landed in the poets, I kind of exploded. That's what it felt like. You know, in retrospect, I felt as if I'd come here with all this balled up energy and somebody handed me a microphone and I was writing poems and I just kind of... You know what, folks? If you want to understand why I've used the word powerful and incomparable and saying that I don't throw those words around lightly is because this is a force of nature that is sitting at the table with me today <laughs> that just touched on having an experience with a half a dozen or a dozen guys because she was gay and because she was a lesbian and she and she survived not only did she survive she thrived absolutely i heard i i i, I Normally, I don't do a lot of research, <laughs> you know, but in the research that I did, I heard you explain that horrific experience being one where some kind of way you zoned out. Absolutely. I mean, it's the only way to survive something like that, I think. And it was as if you had some form, call it what you will, an astral projection or something, and you were almost just kind of watching what was going on yeah. from another place. I think that, you know, because I was such a loud person, and, you know, I, if anyone had talked to me about it before, I would have said, oh, if I, if somebody came to me and was doing something to me, I would just stab them, they would have to take me out, I would, you know, I would go down fighting, they would, ki they would have to kill me first. And I was very silent. I just kind of laid there and I looked at the ceiling and I thought about it as something that was happening to someone else. And it gave me a window into, you know, survival, like, you know, how, how, how it is that humanity can kind of adapt and morph and change so that it can live through something. Yeah. You know, and I'm very glad that I, I'm very glad that I survived it. I'm very glad that I have, you know, I've made something else of it. You know, I can make theater of it. I can make work of it. I can make, you know, uh, I can talk to other women who've had this experience. I know I can speak from a place of experience now mm -hmm. as opposed to like, oh, you know, I know that happened and this is what we should do. There's something amazing, something powerful about being able to say that happened to me yeah. and this is how mm -hmm. I make sense of it now and this is how I think we should survive it. This is my story and it belongs here amidst all the other stories of women who are sexually assaulted. And I'm not going to allow that experience because part of your power that I think that I look at and I appreciate so much is your power was a power that said I'm not going to allow that horrific experience surrounding sex it really is about so much more than that mm -hmm. to deaden you to your sexuality and your absolutely you know the yeah. best revenge i think when something bad happens to you the best revenge you know sometimes you want to go back and you want to beat the people and you want to fight them and you want to yeah. argue with them the yeah. best way to, to to get back at them 
is to take the time, take the space, whether it's therapy or time or, you know, you're working on yourself and you kind of deconstruct and analyze and to come out of it with the ability to love, to laugh, to have sex, to go on a date, to be kind to other people, to yeah. lift a bag for an old lady, to laugh at a joke. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like every time I see people who have tried to do, you know, terrible things to me and they see me and they can still see me laughing and they can still see me kind of like throw my head back and yeah. make a joke and yeah. like, you know, you know, tickle somebody yeah. or, you know, I mean, I won't invite them when I'm having sex, but when I'm having sex, yeah. it's good. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So, so uh -huh. I think that when those things happen and I find myself whole yeah. and, and, and able to, to, to kind of be a full human being, right. I feel like I won. Hello. <laughs> you're not just powerful, you're a winner. I want to... Um, let my production staff know we're not going to take any breaks between now and the top of the hour. We're going to keep on talking. We're going to keep on making this do what it do. I'm easy. I'm I, easy. I, I, I'm I, easy I, with I, that. I, I, you easy? I mean, well, you know, it depends <laughs> yeah. on who's asking. <laughs> um, so you came from Jamaica with this rage. You come to New York and like, damn, you know, it ain't what I thought it was going to be. Um, you're having that kind of experience, so there's some rage there. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that rage, you did a poem, or you did some writing, or you did something yes, that I attracted, you know, people in high places. <laughs> Can you share a quick poem? Can from I that, share a quick poem? From that time? From that time. From that rage. Am I a feminist or a womanist? The student needs to know if I do men occasionally and primarily, am I a lesbian? Tongue tied up in my cheek, I attempt to respond with some honesty. Well, this business of dykes and dykery, I tell her, is often messy. With social tensions as they are, you never quite know what you're getting. Girls who are only straight at night. Hardcore butches be sporting dresses between nine and six during the day. Sometimes he is a she trapped by the limitations of our imaginations. Primarily, I tell her, I am concerned about young women who are raped on college campuses, in bars, after porch readings like this one, in cars, bruised lip and broken heart. You will forgive her if she doesn't come forward with the truth immediately, for when she does, it is she who will stand trial as damaged goods. Everyone will say she asked for it. Dressed as she was, she must have wanted it. The words will knock about in her head. Horny, bitch, slut, tease, harlot, loose woman. Some people cannot handle a woman on the loose. You know those women in silk ties and pinstripe shirts. Those women in blood red stiletto heels and short pink skirts. These women make New York City the most interesting place. And while we're on that subject of diversity, Asia is not one big race, and there is no such country called the islands, and no, I am not from there. There are a hundred ways to slip between the cracks of our not so credible cultural assumptions about race and religion. Most people are surprised that my father is Chinese, like there's some kind of preconditioned look for the half Chinese lesbian poet who used to be Catholic but now believes in dreams. Let's keep it real, says the boy in the double X hooded sweatshirt. That blue eyed, blonde haired Jesus in the Vatican ain't right. I'm like, I was Jewish, not white. Christ was a Middle Eastern Rastaman who ate grapes in the company of prostitutes and drank wine more than he drank water. Born of the spirit, the disciples loved him in the flesh, but the discourse is not on those of us who clearly identify as gay or lesbian or straight. The state needs us to be a clear left or right. Those in the middle get caught in the cross. Fire away at the other side. If you're not for us, you must be against us. When people get scared enough, they pick a team. But be it for Buddha or Krishna or for Christ, I believe God is that place between belief and what you name it. I believe holy is what you do when there is nothing between your actions and your truth. The truth is, I'm afraid to draw black lines around me. I'm not always pale in the middle. I come in too many flavors for one single spoon. Never one thing or, or the other. I never one thing or the other. At night, I am everything I fear. Tears and sorrows, black windows and muscled, muscled screams. In the morning, I am all I ever wanted to be. Rain and laughter, bare footprints, invisible seams, always without breath, without definition. I claim every single dawn. For yesterday, yesterday is simply what I was. And tomorrow, even that will be gone. <laughs> See, you see why I say incomparable? 
You see why I say powerful, incomparable? Can you and your wife come and live with me and just tell me that every day? You come live with us. Bring the baby. Bring the baby. We just got a new little puppy, and we're going to be one big happy family. <laughs> um, tell us about the other side of paradise. The Other Side of Paradise is a memoir of growing up. I, it's a story of how I kind of, you know, walked the road, this kind of crazy road of being abandoned by my mother and not claimed by my father and this kind of weird uh, temporary relationship with my grandmother and separation from my brother and kind of coming of age in a world where everything seems to be coming at you but still kind of maintaining the the desire to be that self you know you could be. Yeah. You know, inside of a yeah. world that doesn't really allow us to be all of who we are. You know, what the hell is up with the eight hour day? <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is that? You know, people need to pee and eat and sleep when it is that they desire such things. And when you're in a, an office or a cubicle, I mean, people don't, don't, I'm not telling the people to quit and go home because, you know, rent has to be paid That's and everything. Right. But right. the notion of this kind of odd 10 hours out of your day being given to one place, especially if it's a place you don't love, it's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's like anti-production. What will you say to your daughter in that regard? I am interested in what she will say to me in that mm -hmm. regard. Mm -hmm. I, you know, people always say to Zuri, Zuri, you're so lucky to have your mom. But I already know from watching other mother-daughter stories play out in the world to know that she will have her own journey, she will have her own issues, she will have her own quarrels with me because I am me. Yeah. And I'm trying to make room for that and try not to, try to, to, to understand that she comes to me with her own intention with her own path ahead and you know I'm just supposed to be facilitating that one and two I'm supposed to be putting away money for therapy because you know she'll probably need it <laughs> <laughs> I sit there's someone sitting in this room it is not my wife mm -hmm. but there's someone close to me they tried they tried desperately to have a baby mm. And they tried every form and they shared with me how expensive it was and how challenging it was. To Can you say that again, how expensive it is? It's a whole other health care thing, but we yeah. will do that the next show. Okay. Yeah. And they were unsuccessful. You wanted to have a baby and <laughs> you were successful. Tell us about the experience. Um, it remains the the most moving, the most impacting, the most life-changing experience I have had so far. You know, this business of lending your body to somebody for nine months, I don't know where these, they get these beatific pictures of these women who like, you know, stand under the sunlight looking all, you know, yeah. angelic. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. process is brutal. Yeah. It's terrible. You know, your body gets stretched out. I mean, things happen to you that I can't tell you on this show because you might lose your license. Uh huh. I understand. Right. I so, understand. Right. So, so. Um, but even but, before you but, get to the body. But before we even get there, you yeah. know, I, I, I decided I wanted to be a mother. Yeah. And I wanted to experience that, especially because I had not experienced it as a child. I did not have that mother-daughter relationship as a daughter. And I didn't have that kind of biological closeness with people who, 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 who I termed family. Um, and so I wanted that. I really, really, really wanted that. And I decided I was going to do it regardless of having a partner, regardless of having money. And so I put all my resources in and I crossed my fingers and went for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it happened. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, it's just and crazy experience. You know, you jam yourself with like... Um, with, with, with injections and you turn into a crazy person and it's like this kind of the most natural thing but it's the most artificial thing in the world and, and but I wouldn't change it for a thing, a, a thing. you know she, she's, she's, she remains such a miracle you know I, she's a cool little cat we travel the world together you know you, you didn't have the resources to make that happen no but the force of nature that you are listen I begged I borrowed you know I'm still paying back people now 
for the money I borrowed for some of those things mm. for, you know, and then I was on bed rest. I was really, 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 really sick. And you told uh, some of the hospitals, you know, you just got to do this. You don't I, have no I choice. I walked up in there. I told to them, the, the, listen to me. I will, every lesbian who wants to have a baby, I will tell them to come here. Yeah. I have a huge following online. I will tell them to come to you to get pregnant and give you their money. Yeah. You know, so, so treat me nice and, 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 and give me a baby. Make this baby thing happen. Yeah. I really, really, really wanted this kid. And it just, just kind of like happened, you know, the stroke. And on Mother's Day 2011, they tell me not to test. And I tested and she was in there. <laughs> <laughs> and you felt how? Completely changed. Completely changed already. I was like, oh my God, of course, the self-doubt is setting in. What have you done, Stacey? And this is crazy, yeah. crazy. The child has no grandmother. She has no grandfather. She has no uncles and aunts, you know. She got an uncle and an aunt. <laughs> she got an uncle Rock and an aunt Didi right now. <laughs> and, you know, we, we don't have much family, you know. Yeah. We don't have, and I'm, I'm basically alone in New York, but... I don't know, man. I just, you know, I, I just do the damn thing. They just get up and change the diaper and move. And, you know, I wanted a kid. I went and got a kid. It was crazy. It was the craziest experience. I mean, I, I went crazy. My girlfriend left in the middle of the process. I was jamming myself with needles, taking menopure, folistim, all this stuff. I do. You know, I was, the eggs were growing fast. I was like going crazy. The eggs were growing. I was going crazy. And, you know, and the woman left and I was like, oh my God. And then I got pregnant. And then I was sick for nine months. I was laid up in my bed, like unable to move, unable to eat, unable to sleep, unable to go anywhere, unable to work for how long? Uh, but she came, she held on, she fought the odds, and she's here with all of her, you know, little parts all in place, and she's telling me no already, and telling yeah. me no hugs. Uh-huh. And telling me, like, no. Yeah. No. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I don't know, it, it's, it's fabulous. And she teaches you you're human, and wake up with hope in my heart every day. Yeah. Because, you know, the sidewalk is an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> when you have a kid, you know? Yeah, yeah. Zuri. Zuri. Is I- that her? Where does that name come from? Zuri. Um, it occurs in a bunch of different languages. And um, that's her, right? Uh, yeah, it, occur- it, it occurs in a bunch of different languages. It means love or beautiful. It, I think it, uh, it happens in, um, in, in, in Japanese, in, in Zulu, in Swahili, in a bunch of different places. So. Let me, tell you, let me uh, see. This is live streaming, and this is The Rock Newman Show. And I happen to be in charge of this. So, what, so we can make a decision to say, bring Zuri up her to her mommy. Mama. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm about to breastfeed because it's a sure way. Come on, this is the Rock Newman Show, and we do it, it live quiet. on the Rock Newman Show. See? Quiet. Look okay. at that. Look at that. Zuri, you are Put a beautiful a breast baby. Put in the mouth, and it's fine. You should breastfeed. It's the best thing. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here to testify, <laughs> and I got a witness out there. <laughs> um, this is as, as live and as impromptu and as spontaneous as the Rock Newman Show has been. I want to tell you, this is a first. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, tell us about your one-woman play. That you're getting ready to rock and bust boys and poets at 5th and K Street tonight. Oh, Lord. You know, I wrote the show. This show is all about what we've been talking about, about the, you know, you know, about hitting 30 and going like, you know, feeling your eggs kind of cracking inside of you because you know they're drying up. And you're like, God, I want the baby. I want the baby. You start uh-huh. looking at people's babies in the supermarket and go, she don't need that baby. Mm-hmm. She don't, I, I, you know, if I mm-hmm. take this baby, I think the cops going to find me. Mm. You know, this is the kind of thing, you, you know, you're looking at, and as a lesbian, I'm looking at men going, he's got a really nice set of teeth. I wonder if he's opposed to giving me some sperm. Uh-huh. Yeah, so those are the kind of thoughts you're running through your head, and you're like going crazy. You're like, Do I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. You have any interest in what kind of thoughts are running through my head right now? If you want to talk to me, what I, I'm only breastfeeding. I'm looking listen. at that baby and wishing I was a baby. <laughs> Um, it's like when I was uh, um, when I just found out that I was a lesbian. I used to look at the women in my class um, chewing on pencils and thinking, "I wish I was a pencil." <laughs> <laughs> you are extraordinarily um, open with your with your sexuality. Yes, I mean, how you going to close it up? How the thing the thing don't work if you close it up? Yeah, 
<laughs> and you and and and, and you're, you're not only are you open, you're public. Yes. Yes, you, yes, you, yes. You, you, you write on your... You know, my mother, when I was young, and all the stories I heard about her, she was a compulsive liar, and she was extremely private. So when I was about 16 or 17 years old, I was like, you know what? That is not going to work out for me. Yeah. So I decided to become extremely candid and extremely public. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, maybe I'm a textbook case. I'm just, I'm just resisting my mother. <laughs> uh -huh. re re resisting, and, resisting. And, resisting and rebelling? Resisting and rebelling, you know, I mean... I'm going to do it till I'm dead, man. So tell us about, tell us, uh, what, what can folks expect to come to see? The name of her play, we can't say. Now, that It's would. the placeholder. It's not, it's a placeholder. Because, yeah. you know, it's like my favorite word. It's like the word, you know, you know. It, 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 the first part of it is mother. The second part of it rhymes with trucker. <laughs> and that's the placeholder. That's the, that's the name of the play. Yeah. What, are, what are folks going to see when they come see you? They're going to see the story of, you know, of, of, of how I've walked this journey of finding family, creating family, and surviving, you know, this kind of crazy period of changing from being, you know, a, a lesbian in Brooklyn who, you know, would have sex, you know, sometimes in her apartment and now can't have sex in her apartment at all. Uh -huh. Because she's got a kid that she's uh -huh. like, you know, ain't rolling. that a mother? I, um, ain't that a mother trucker? <laughs> yeah. um, what does. Do you have a description for love? Yeah, love is many things, I think. Um, and I think before Zuri was born, love for me, it was very caught up with the, um, the, the business of passion and sex and. And now I understand like the expansion of the idea of love. Love is a discipline. Love is being able to lend your body to someone else. Love is being able to let them walk away if that's what they need to do. Love is, you know, it, you know I think love happens when your best self is present and the other person's best self is present mm -hmm. and they can coexist. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think for me, you know, the woman I'm seeing now is, extra, I've, you know, we've been in and out of a relationship for about 16 years. Yep. I mean, we really should just close the oh, damn thing. Oh, wow, wow. But, but you know, she, um, she has a remarkable ability to, um, to kind of adapt, to kind of move through things and allow things to, allow the edges of things to be, um, I don't know, amniotic, allow the edges of things to kind of be. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, to love somebody, you know, you have to decide that I'm going to be with you. I'm going to put up with your crap yeah. even as you grow and change. I don't know who you're going to be, but yeah. who you're going to be, I'm going to love it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that, that, that is amazing. So lots of breakups and obvious, obviously yes. the, the, and I, and I had, lots of makeups. Uh, yeah, and I made up with some other people in between there too and broke <laughs> up with them too. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's made it interesting, man. Yeah. It's made it interesting. Yeah. So, so, so would, the, would, would the breakups become more and more dr traumatic, dramatic and traumatic? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. You know, you kind of expect it. You know, I find that as I grow older, I am able to move more easily through things that are either hurtful or amazing or moving or disruptive more easily. Mm -hmm. But I also find that um, they don't happen as often. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so bigger things happen more infrequently. Right. Because now I know how to avoid trouble. Right. And then so I'm old enough now to know the kinds of trouble I can take on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, would those increasingly traumatic and dramatic and traumatic breakups mm -hmm. lend themselves to more greatly passionate makeups or no yes I, I think I don't I think I think I think we don't make up as often but when we do it's astounding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes whereas it might have been just a lot of fun when I was young, but now it's... And, it and do, you ever, do you ever think that part of the process of breaking up mm -hmm. is so that you can have the euphoria of making up? Well, you know, hu hu 
humanity is wide and changing, and I think, um, I think that you have to grow, and every, every time you grow and change, it requires some trauma and some drama, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. the trauma and the drama feed themselves, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, I think you definitely need a little bit of breaking up uh -huh. so that the making up can be Hot. astounding. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and because you're a human being and you change, there's always going to be stuff that you don't like and stuff that, you know, and you have to change. And maybe during this time, I'm not as into you as before. You know, how long have you been together with your wife? Um, we've been married 30 years. 30 Next years. Month. Next yes, month. so you know. You, oh, yeah. God, 30 years. 30. You have to tell me how you do it. When yeah. the show finishes, you have to, you must have a, like a one-page write-up about how to stay together. You do? Uh-huh. Yeah, how, so you can just give me. How we stay together is being apart a lot. Right, yeah. and that's it. And being apart means that you have experiences that are not just, you, you know, are not just about the person. Yeah. And so when you come together, you either have things to argue about or things mm -hmm. to share. Mm -hmm. Yes. And maybe the sharing is the arguing. I don't know. But yeah. you know, it, like, I, I, she's, she lives in Jamaica. She lives abroad. So uh -huh. you know, we've oh. never quite been in the same space. So there's some of that that I think that is, has been good for us. Some space, you know, allow her to have experiences, allow me to have ex different experiences, you know. Do you long to live in Jamaica again? I long to be able to be how I am when I am my most kind of out and lesbian and uh, I mean I don't, I, it's not even about being lesbian but when I'm in spaces like these I don't think about being lesbian it's kind of just it's as, it's as relevant as my shoe size uh -huh. and in Jamaica I have to navigate being lesbian like I have to know that okay if I say it in this space some people might get upset or if I say it here I might be unsafe uh -huh. do you know what I mean yeah, so, I so, so it requires a kind of mental um, acrobatics that I don't have to put up with here. And so I long for, have, for that. I, I, I would love to have that in Jamaica, just to kind of not, not have anyone say to Zuri, you know, that it's wrong to be gay or for her to see that as normal, just kind of in the streets or right. anywhere so, or in church. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to get to as a daughter of the soil mm -hmm. of Jamaica. I miss Jamaica, man. Yeah. I, miss, I miss the food. I miss the people. I miss hearing accents that sound like mine. I miss summer all the time, you know, but, you know, New York has also grown its own beautiful callous on yeah. what of me or that, you know, that, that, that is, you know, love or hope or home. Um, so New York is home in a weird kind of way, mm -hmm. as much as Jamaica is home. You know, I've spent 16 years in New York, almost half my life. Right, right. So um, as Zuri goes to school, <laughs> as she goes to school, Mm -hmm. what, what are your dreams for her? I want her to be happy. I want her to do with her day things that give her pleasure. I want her to fall in love. I want her to have family, have good friends. I want her to be able to explore every aspect of who she could be. I want her to be able to do it safely. I want her to be good to other people. I want her to be kind. I really want her to be an activist. But if she isn't, it's all right. I just want her to be good to the people with whom she interacts. I want her to be a good person. You did a, you, 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 you did a poem that set this room on fire. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite from your repertoire? A favorite? That's like asking if you have a favorite kid, which is easy for me because I only have one. Yeah. But um, I don't know, you know? I mean, I have poems that I think are, 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 are worse than others. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't think I have favorites, you know? If you had said yes, mm -hmm. I was going to say, would you do one more for us? <laughs> one more, one more. You see, I have to also um, find a poem that is, um, that I, I can, I, you know, it's clean. Mm, right, that's what I'm saying. Kind of, sort of. I mean, but, you, have, you know. You have a delay that you can edit? No, you see, I'm in my head. What can we do? A poem, a poem, a poem. Um, I don't have a poem with me. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Um, when you are on stage, mm. describe that feeling. It's like levitating, man. We, you know, when people are getting it, and and like when we when I did the poem earlier, and I, I you know I started speaking, everybody's kind of listening, kind of laid back, and then I started doing the poem, and then I could see them 
you know, sit up like prairie dogs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know that they're kind of engaged and there's this kind of uh, conversation happening because what they do with their faces, what they do with their hands, tells me that I am in conversation with them, that they're no longer like looking at their phones or yeah. that, that, that something is happening. And it's a kind of, um, it's almost like making love, man. Uh-huh. Yeah, but not touching. So it's like, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of push-pull tension. Absolutely. It's sexy, man, it's sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Intoxicating? Yes. And definitely, you know, the, the more it is that people are engaged in the performance, yeah. the more it feels like a, a kind of, you know, intoxication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if I'm talking to people and they're not really responding, even if I'm doing a good job, it doesn't feel the same. So even if I'm doing a bad job and I'm making mistakes and coughing or forgetting words and people are engaged, yeah. there's something, it's like, it's, it's like theater, man. It's like live show. It's like... You know, like I'm pushing something out there and they're pushing something back and it's kind of like together out there in the stratosphere and like when they leave and, you know, they write me on Facebook and be like, oh my God, I was thinking about blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's amazing. I can't imagine you doing anything else. I mean, this is, <laughs> I, I believe this is who and it's what you were born to be. <laughs> if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would Stacey Ann Chen be doing? I think I'd be teaching. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd be teaching, which is probably something that I'm going to do. I mean, like next summer I teach at the new school, I think. Uh -huh. um, but, but I would be teaching. Or, you know, I don't know. I mean, I would try something new, like, I don't know, like, like, elect, like being an electrician. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. be like all like sexy lesbian with like a tool belt you know what i mean uh -huh, yeah you like climb stairs and like uh -huh. hammer things and like right now would you have pants on when you climb the stairs or short skirt or? um I, like i would switch it up uh-huh i would be like pants today yeah short skirt tomorrow mm -hmm. or i would do like a short skirt and a button down with a tie what come on uh -huh. sexy plug it up plug it up electricity <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Zuri. Say hi. Zuri, ain't nothing happening. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting paid. I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not, I am not even doing that. Um, we are mortal beings. Mm. What you're saying is we're going to all die. We're going to get up. Right. We're going we to check out. Right, right, right. We're we going to check out. Mm -hmm. How do you want to be remembered? As a person who made the world better. Like I didn't make it worse. Mm -hmm. Like what I brought made the world better. The ideas that I expounded made people's lives better. And, you know, on a closer, smaller circle, like the people with whom I interacted closely felt as if, you know, I was good to them. They were good to me. And so we were engaged in something beautiful. Yeah. You know? So... People are, you know, people in the world are so unkind to each other. Yes. So, I mean, I really value kindness, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's right. Zuri? What? It's your turn. <laughs> Do you want to sing is something? Drop dead sing. gorgeous. Sing. Well, not now. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, as a, what was it that, caused you to be a poet do you yeah. how do you how do you answer that or, or, can, um, or can you I, I came from a place where stories were told uh -huh. and stories were told in fine dramatic style you know if you ask my grandmother like grandma what you know do you remember what exact day i was born she'd be like well i think your brother was born on a tuesday and he was born when it was raining. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, two hours later, we're still sitting here, <laughs> you know. Right. So, so I, I think that's a Southern tradition as well. Uh -huh. I, I think that I come from storytellers, and then I became a lover of words. Uh -huh. And what in the world tells a story better with really good wording than poetry? Nothing. I love you. I love you too, Rock Newman. Big love, big love, and big gratitude for having me on. Thank I had you such so a much. good time. Thank you so much, and I look forward to when we can do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. You too, Zuri. Say bye. We love you too. Mwah. Say bye. She ain't having it. Ain't having it. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much. This wraps up today's September 28th version of the Rock Newman Show. 
I wish, I wish I would be seeing all of you, but so many of you waited too long to get tickets to the sold out <laughs> Stacey Ann Chin show tonight. We will be, I will have our face in the place and we'll see you next week. Same time, same place, Rock Newman Show. Listen up tonight. Tell your friends if you missed some of this. We Act Radio, 1480 AM broadcast tonight from 6 to 9. God bless you until I see you again next Saturday morning right here. Langston Hughes Room at Busboys and Poets. Signing off.